Well, thank you for joining us again, everybody, as we continue in our study through the book of Judges. I got the, the name of the book right this week. You did. So it's a great way to start. Um, I'm happy you got that name right. Thank you. I, I did have to look down at the page just All to make right. sure, but but we got it. So um, we will uh, start as we normally do with prayer. So okay. Marty, I'll ask you to start us, please. Sure. Father in heaven, we thank you again that you are our God that you have promised us yourself and your presence. Um, you use us, Lord, to do the things that we cannot do, but you do them through us because you're a powerful God and you do them all for your glory. Uh, Lord, use this morning that we might marvel at your greatness, mm -hmm. that we might be taught to trust in you. Through Christ we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so uh, we're going to get a little crazy here and mix it up. Crazy. Yeah, we're going to get actually Marty to read our scripture reading this week. It shows you how Presbyterian we are, <laughs> that that's getting crazy, <laughs> right. you know, to, to have a different person read yeah. the scripture. But I'm totally fine with doing yeah. that. So. so next week, we, you know, we might get really crazy and have someone else completely, you know, do the moderating part. We'll see. That would be too crazy. Yeah. I don't um, even think the word crazy defines that. <laughs> Well, yeah, that'll make the announcements list. Um, so, uh, so we're going to read here all of chapter seven. So we uh, started in with Gideon last week, um, with at least that last part of chapter six being a pretty well-known passage, and then I think here in chapter seven, probably a pretty well-known passage mm -hmm. to a lot of people as well. Right. Um, so, Marty, I'll ask you to go ahead and read that for us, please. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him, rose early and camped beside the spring of Harod, and the camp of Midian was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands, for Israel would become boastful, saying, My power has delivered me. Now therefore come, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. So 22,000 returned, but 10,000 remained. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Therefore it shall be that he of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But every one of whom I say to you, This one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, You shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. Now the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men, but all the rest of the people kneeled to drink water. The Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with the 300 men who lapped and will give the Midianites into your hands. So let all the people, all the other people go, each man to his house. So the 300 men took the people's provisions and their trumpets into their hands. And Gideon sent all the other men of Israel, each to his tent, but retained the 300, the 300 men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. Now the same night it came about that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hands. And if you are afraid to go down, go with Puro, your servant, down to the camp, and you will hear what they say, and afterward your hands will be strengthened that you may go down against the camp. So he went with Pura, his servant, down to the outpost of the army that was in the camp. Now the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the sons of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number as numerous as the sand on the sea, seashore. When, Get, <clears throat> excuse me, when Gideon came, behold, a man was relating a dream to his friend. And he said, behold, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of Midian. And it came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. His friend replied, this is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the man of Israel. God has given Midian and all the camp into his hand. 
When Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed and worshiped. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the camp of Midian into your hands. He divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put trumpets and empty pitchers into the hands of all of them with torches inside the pitchers. He said to them, Look at me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I and all who are with me blow the trumpet, then you also blow the trumpets all around the camp and say, For the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, when they had just posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets and smashed the pitchers that were in their hands. When the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers, they held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing and cried, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran, crying out as they fled. When they blew three hundred trumpets, the Lord set the sword of one against another, even throughout the whole army, and the army fled as far as Beth Shittah, towards Zerera, and as far as the edge of Abel Mahola by Tabath. The men of Israel were summoned from Naphtali and Asher and all Manasseh, and they pursued Midian. Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against Midian and take the waters before them, as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were summoned, and they took the waters as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. They captured the two leaders of Midian, Oreb and Zeeb, and they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and they killed Zeeb at the winepress of Zeeb while they pursued Midian. And they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon from across the Jordan. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm curious, Marty, if you're going to give any like historical information about you know, the, the uh, importance of crushed jars and warfare. Or I, like I have some insights, but what's interesting, and we'll get to that, I know, is uh, and, and Davis makes this point. Some people make a lot of the tactics. The tactics are interesting, but the tactics are not why they win. Mm-hmm. The tactics, they God delivers the Midianites into their hands. God sets the sword of one Midianite against another. Yeah. Right. But, but it is fascinating <clears throat> when you kind of look at what they do. It is. All right. So we'll jump in with our first question here then. Why was God <clears throat> so intent on showing Gideon his weakness? I think Marty already referenced that. Um, and I think Davis references it and the scripture references it. God's power is made perfect in the weakness of his people. And um, the passage referenced the fact that Israel has a history of beating their own chest and making it about them. And God wanted to remove that totally from the possibility. And so he reduced them down to 300 men. And like Marty said, they really didn't attack at all. It's reminiscent of Jericho. They marched around, made a bunch of noise. It happened at midnight when shifts were changing. There was confusion. They attacked each other, and in the confusion, they fled. And so it really was pursuing, but the whole thing was in reference to who was responsible, and that is strictly and only God. Yeah, and the way that he keeps peeling them down. So they start out with 32,000, and I think the uh, Midianites were probably like 135,000 initially. Mm -hmm. Well, the Israelites might still say, yeah, you know, we beat them. They had a four to one advantage. We yeah. still beat them. Right. And then, uh, you know, you, you get 22,000 go home. But somebody could have said, well, we got rid of the morale killers right. and we were left with 10,000 elites. So we beat an enemy that was, you know, 13 to one. But then it's like, no, nah, that's too many. So now you're going to be down to 300. I mean, just nobody's going to make the argument. Nobody with unless their heart is hard and proud is going to argue that 300 people can beat 135,000. That does not happen. Right. Yeah. Not without a holy God fighting for you. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it says it right here in, uh, I think it's verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying my own hand mm-hmm. has saved me. So, mm-hmm. yeah, there's that idea. God is is, is clearly... You know, showing his hand here as to why he's doing what he's doing. 
Um, he wants to be sure that 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 they and everyone knows that uh, that he's the one who deserves the glory in this. That there's no possible way 300 men, to your point, could do this without some sort of divine intervention. That there's right. there's something much bigger than just the the might of these men at play, um, and that really it is the Lord Himself right. who, through various ways, orchestrates this to show that that He's the one who's great not they, and uh, and that he's the one who deserves the glory. That's right. All right. We'll go to question two here then. <clears throat> How does God assure Gideon? Why does Gideon need such assurance? Okay, so what's that assurance that God gives Gideon? Go down to the camp, hmm. and you know, it, it's, he doesn't really get much more than that. Just take Pura, your servant, and go down to the camp. So they come slinking up to one of the uh, sentries, sentry positions, and God uses, as Davis says, a Midianite private to proclaim to Gideon that he's going to use Gideon to destroy the Midianites. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to what, and, and then how much would this have circulated? There probably wasn't even time for it to cir- the, the rumor to circulate a lot or for that report. In other words, I don't know that all the Midianites are going, who's this Gideon guy and he's going to kill us. But but this one Midianite private, God uses this pagan to tell Gideon what he's going to do. Yeah, and he does it through a, a rather strange <clears throat> dream. I guess dreams are always strange yeah. in a sense. But uh, but it's interesting to see you know, in that strange dream that he gets, immediately he takes this as, as a sign from God. Uh, that he's going to be delivered. All right. Well, in, in ancient times, dreams were a big deal mm-hmm. and the interpretation of them were a big deal. And so that probably that dream sequence in this passage probably meant more to people in the past than it does to us today. But the other aspect is um, Davis brings about that it exposes Gideon's fear and then it and God takes his fear and converts it to, to a strong faith. And he immediately worships Right, he immediately worships there, and then from there he has the courage, understanding that who God is, gets cl- gets some clarity that God is going to deliver them, and is able to command his troops appropriately. So I think you know, for me as a Western American in 2020, I don't quite get the sense or the impact of the dream, but I think it was, according to Davis, pretty impactful at that point in time, and to those who read it back then. Or in the old, you know, back in the Old Testament or medieval times. So, well, yeah. So you, you get a, a pretty instant response when when the dreams reported. It's you know the response is his comrade answered, "This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. <clears throat> God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. So it's just immediate. Yeah, God knows what it is. And if you think about it, you got one hundred and thirty three thousand troops, and God just allows Gideon to creep up on the one. Midianite who's relaying to his friend the dream. Hmm. I mean, so clearly God is at work here. And when he calls Gideon by name. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, there's no reason to think they would have even known who Gideon was. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. That is amazing. So um, Davis's other question is here, here is why does Gideon need this assurance? Well, like I said, I mean, it exposes his fear because we see that from the very beginning where he relays all the reasons he can't be the commander. Right? I'm from the smallest clan. I'm the weakest. I'm the youngest. Da, 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 it, it list goes on. And God here is exposing you're fearful. You're not trusting. But then he strengthens his faith by allowing him to hear that dream, allowing the dream to impact and give him courage and allowing him to rest instead of, instead of resting in his human fear, he rests in God's sovereignty and his, and his faith in God. So I think, you know, Davis does a good job of pointing that out. You really see God's patience with Gideon because it's like God could say, I told you Mm -hmm. multiple times. We did the fleece once. We did the fleece twice. You know, I mean, you, 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 you've, you've heard over and over and over again. Right. And now God, but God is patient to give him one more encouragement. And consistent with Gideon. I mean, again, he's. He's being, like you said, being patient and stooping down once more, one more time to, okay, Gideon, one more time, I'm going to show you who I am. I'm going to show you that I've got you on this. But he's he's consistent throughout with Gideon. Okay. Well, we'll get to our last question then. Why does God choose to use the weak and lowly 
to bring about his purposes. Well, I mean, it's pretty clear. I mean, it's, you know, in order that there is no confusion about who is victorious in this battle, it is God. And, uh, and he points out, as we referenced a little while ago, that Israel in their past has, has beat their own chest, has brought attention to themselves, has taken credit for things that don't belong to them. And God wants to make it clear that I am your God and I am fighting this battle and victory is mine. And, uh, I'll reduce your whole thing down to 300 people, you know, and there's, there's discussion. Davis brings up the fact that he even quotes a passage about the lapping, you know, and, and reading into what that means. And he discounts that as it means only one thing. It's the mechanism God uses to choose the 300. And it's the 300 people that God chooses and not Gideon chooses or anything like that. So again, it's just to remove all doubt that they're, they had anything to do with this. It's, Totally God. Yeah, the laughing thing is funny. It's yeah. just a funny visual in the head to yeah. see these guys just putting their mouths down to the water, <clears throat> laughing yeah. water up like a dog, I guess, culturally. I've never seen anybody do it that way instead well, of Well, I remember when I was a little kid on a, on camping trips and, you know, where there would be clear running rivers, I guess we so might go over and, you know, um, just slurp it up, you know, yeah. before I learned whatever. We do that camping. I mean, if you're thirsty and you, bet, you find a stream, you get down and you... Suck it right out of the river. Yeah. I mean, now we've learned that there's whatever kind of spores in the water that, you know, will uh, will kill you. But, um, yeah, I, I think it is interesting that, that Davis touches on that, that so, there have been a lot of sermons and books written that go on a bunch of, you know, they kind of unfolded as these brilliant tactics by these, you know, sort of the 300 Spartans almost. Right. You know, so it's, um, you got to hunt, you know, you get rid of the people that are, that are faint hearted. And then you, you know, and, and, and like Davis mentions this, it jumped into my mind almost this, you know, sort of these steely special forces types that are taking a drink of water while they're still scanning the horizon. Right, right. You know, the enemy and, that's four miles away. You know, and it's like, and, and, you know, we've all kind of seen those movies where they're about to go clean some house, you know, and that's not the point here. And then people also can get into the tactics, you know, and say, well, yeah, you know, you divide come from three directions, the noise of pot smashing, of trumpets, of men yelling. But again, the whole point here is there's three, they're outnumbered 400 to one. And all they're doing is making noise. And that's not, that's just not the way you'd um, win a battle. I mean, the only, the only reason that the Midianites are given into their hands is because God gives the Midianites into their and I think it's good, you know, I think it's really powerful that Davis points that out in other commentaries. These other commentaries that point out tactics and special forces are doing exactly what God wanted to avoid, mm-hmm. is giving credit where it doesn't belong mm-hmm. to the to the 300 or to Gideon. That's not why God chose the 300. He chose the 300 so the credit only belonged to him. And so he was the sole focus of the victory. And so when you when you read other commentaries that continue to read into the text and say, well, the laughing, you know, they're looking at their enemy, or that's exactly what God was trying to avoid and why he chose the 300 to begin with. And so I think Davis does a really good job of pointing that out and making that crystal clear. Yeah. Davis makes the point they're not they're not only <clears throat> warriors, they're just horn blowers. Yep. <laughs> that's really all they 300 did. people who just made noise. That's true. Yeah, yeah. So you don't really get the story here that, that they then go in or and they're just somehow uh, <clears throat> amazing warriors or anything like that. Yeah, no. it's, it's quite. I mean, he actually talks part. about the fact that their main action was pursuing. They didn't battle. They didn't attack. Their the main action was after the confusion. They fled for home and they just pursued them. Mm-hmm. And so they God put them on a defensive. Yeah, not the three hundred. You know, I think about that. Uh, and of course, that's a theme we see all throughout Scripture, God using the weak and lowly to accomplish his mighty purposes. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we can think of a lot of examples of that. You know, we jump forward to the New Testament. Uh, we see how Paul really highlights this, um, that the Lord's strength is made perfect in his weakness and our weakness, um, that God is shown to be who he is, to be truly powerful, to be truly glorious um, in our own weaknesses. And, you know, I think about that, particularly now, I guess, as we're in the Advent season, um, you know, the coming of the Messiah Mm -hmm. just isn't what you expect it to be. Um, Not anything that the world would expect it to be. Um, 
the coming of the King of Kings is just in a lowly manger somewhere. Um, no, no big fanfare that the world knows about. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's not even space for it. He's not, he's not born in some palatial right. your context uh, with servants all around. It's consistent all that. It's with this theme of weakness. Yeah, it's this lowliness. Uh, it's, it's humility. Uh, I think Philippians says he sort of emptied himself is one way that, that it gets mm-hmm. interpreted, emptied himself of the, of the glory that, that was, is due him, um, and comes weak and lowly. Uh, to save his people. So again, we see this is way back here, but all the way through to the New Testament. And then I think, you know, fast forward now then to our time, that's that's true, of course, still today, that um, God is doing amazing things, um, not primarily through um, the people that make the papers. Um, you know, I, sometimes with, with some of my uh, non-Christian friends, co-workers, whatever, when you when you do see a headline of some pastor or church that did something crazy or, or, or immoral or, or whatever it is. And they always want to talk to us about right. what you know, they're yeah. like, hey, why did you guys do this? Like, I, I, wait, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. So I always like to remind those people, Mike, you know, that that's one guy or that's one church. Um, and, and particularly when, when pastors fall and it, maybe you, you get a couple of them in a row or something like that. Um I, I, I like to tell those guys, look, I, because of my background, I know a lot of pastors. Mm. And um, the vast, vast, vast majority of them are serving faithfully, quietly. They're never going to make the papers. Um, but it's because they're serving faithfully and quietly that they're not going to make the papers. Yeah. And, and that's <clears throat> the norm of the way we see God moving his kingdom forward. It's not... Every once in a while, you know, you see you get a Billy Graham come along or something like that. But that's the exception. That's not the norm. It's it's the quiet. It's the the meek and lowly that the Lord um, ordinarily is pleased to use. And that theme of weakness, it's all over the Old and New Testament. You know, you find it in the form of humility. You know, you usually see humble or humility in Scripture. It's usually an imperative implied pronoun. You humble yourself. It's not something that's one time thing. It's something you do daily. It's something that you see in God's people that he uses, you know, this idea of humility. Um, I think this theme of weakness is, is something that is uh, prominent in Judges, but it also it links Judges to every other book in the Old and New Testament. Um, so, yeah. Well, you know, Davis has a great phrase, that God uses servants, not heroes. And, you know, sometimes we think we're not being useful because we're not a hero. Mm-hmm. But God uses servants, not heroes, and He grows His and He grows His kingdom like leaven and bread. And you you don't ever actually. Sometimes what you see is when you step back, you see some grow. You know the the bread's rising, but it's not like you can see each one of those yeast. What are they? Plants or something? You know, yeah. you're not seeing each thing happen, but God's using it right. in a way that's imperceptible to us. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, a lot of the time people get, um, you know, frustrated of things they things they see going on, and, and then they're thinking about what can we do. And a lot of a lot of what we can do is serve the Lord faithfully, um, be in the you know the the ordinary means of grace, be a part of the body of Christ, serving faithfully, growing in our own walk with Christ. We'll get into this next week, I yep. know, but. We can't, you know, I like the way that Davis says in so many words, you see God's people being sometimes proud, sometimes fearful. Well, we can't necessarily control other people being proud or fearful all the time, but we can repent of our own pride. That's right. We can repent of our own anxiety and trust in the Lord. And, um, but, but yeah, God doesn't use these magnificent hero figures. There, what's the, I don't know who originally said it, there are no heroes in the Bible but one. Everybody else is a mess. That's right. Yeah. You know, Davis, like you referenced, Davis said, uh, we'll talk about it next week, God's people disappoint. And so what I got out of that is God's people are not God. I mean, I've talked to so many people who <clears throat> either walked away or have, have decided that, you know, the, the Bible is full of stories. And all of them reference God's people. Mm-hmm. They don't reference God. Yeah. And it's God who is God, and we are not. And we are flawed. We're a mess. But through God, we get we we can move closer to Him and grow 
closer to who he is, but we don't need to look at God through his people. We look at God through God. And it's him here that we see. It's God's victory. And he used humble, messy, flawed people. Um, if, you, if you take this 300, these 300 soldiers out and you put them in today's context, I, th- I think 300 special forces would be like, all I get to do is blow a horn. <laughs> is that it? I mean, is that all you want me to do? But that's what God said. Uh, that's all I need you to do. I've got the rest. And so I think it's really important that our focus is God and not his people because his people are flawed. Like the rest of us, we're messy, but God isn't. And God is still on his throne. He's sovereign and he's still in control of everything. Good. All right. It's a good reminder for us then. Yeah. Should you close us in prayer, please? Absolutely. Father, we thank you for this morning and uh, the lesson that you have provided in Judges, Lord. We thank you for the example of Gideon and these 300 men and how you've used them, despite their messiness, to bring you glory. Father, thank you for um, what you're doing in us and through us. Thank you for what you're doing in our world. Father, continue to keep us faithful, humble. May we be servants of you today and every day. Thank you again for the the passage that you provided us to study. And Lord, I lift it up to you and I lift our, our hearts up to you. May we be more like you each and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.